Hashtag the party continues. <laughs> Running a little bit off on the brakes, but you know something? We're going to catch up time. We're good. Welcome back in. Back to Basics continues on this ninth day of February 2016. And I, I was having a brain fart earlier, and I don't know why, but for some reason I felt like I actually said 2015 a little while ago. And that would actually be the first time on air this year that I've screwed up the year. So if I actually did, oh well, I'm going to screw something up else before the day. See what I mean? Fast Study Lane live from Studio One and live from the promoter's desk in the Peach Tate. My tag team partner on Saturday morning, Shane Knowles. What's up, brother? Oh, doing well. How are you, Eddie? It's been a while. Yes. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make the uh, Shooter's Gallery this Saturday. My apologies, but I'll be good to go this weekend. Last week was a roller coaster ride all over again, and you know how crazy it can it can go from zero to nuts in 2.2 seconds. There's actually a double-handed joke in there somewhere. Zero to nuts in two. I was two. thinking the uh, Alabama song, I'm in a hurry and don't know why, it goes from zero to 60 and 5.2. There you go. I like that one better. We'll stick with that. Um, first off, I know you've been uh, conventioning over the weekend, right? Getting some me time, getting some fun time. I did, man. I This is uh, an annual trip I do with a couple of friends. Uh, the Days of the Dead convention, uh, which is now in Atlanta, Georgia, for the last four years. The first year was in Peachtree City down the road. That one holds a special place in my heart because it was a smaller market that had more of an intimate atmosphere. Plus, you really had to know about it, you know, before it became more of a, a big stream, a big time mainstream type deal. But uh, they couldn't have lined up a better lineup for me personally this Saturday, and I wasn't alone in that as it was the highest attended uh, Days of the Dead convention thus far. Uh, on the docket was uh, Cassandra Peterson, better known as Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, um, Tobin Bell. Uh, who played Jigsaw, the Jigsaw Killer in the uh, Saw horror movie franchise. Also, Heather Langenkamp from um, more famously known as Nightmare on Elm Street movies, but I know Eddie also remembers the sitcom Just the Ten of Us. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> in the day. And then, uh, as I have spoken of many times uh, on Saturdays, as well as Robert Cosper, uh, my personal favorite in the pro wrestling business, uh, the Nature Boy Ric Flair. And I just got to say on that, I don't get starstruck much anymore. I've met a lot of actors, a lot of musicians at conventions, certainly worked with a lot of main talent in wrestling. But when he came through, uh, the photo op was at 6.30 Eastern time, Friday evening. When he came walking into Sheraton there in downtown Atlanta, it was like freaking Elvis, dude. I mean, people cell phones snapping, people wooing left and right. And he gave a little strut on his way into the uh, room. But, I mean, it just you got that energy and you saw all these people because even though Nate has been doing a lot of the convention deal, he hasn't been doing it that long, you know. So I think in the Atlanta market it was a really big deal. I counted head count for me probably around 450 to 500 that took part in the photo up Friday evening with Rick Flair. That's fun. You know, and I love the post that you had made because, you know, the, I, I will counteract yours with the never uh, the never dying contact quote of be careful when you meet your heroes. <laughs> yeah. But I am glad everything went well. Glad you had a great time, brother. I'm actually quite jealous because a lot of the names that you've mentioned are names that are actually uh, names that I would love to bump into, meet, talk to, sit down and converse with. Oh, absolutely. My friend Parker was more excited, which, you know, I met, met this gentleman as well, but Phil Ansimino, I hope I'm saying his name right, the front man for the uh, heavy metal band Pantera, yeah. was there, as, as well as uh, Tony Todd, uh, famous for the uh, Candyman horror movie franchise. Right. Um, also, Sid Haig and Bill Mosley from the uh, Rob Zombie film, the uh, House of a Thousand Corpses and Devil's Reject. Of course, I still remember Sid Haig uh, in some of those movies with Pam Greer as well as on the 18th. TV series, but, um, but it was a good time, and uh, it just made me think because this popped up on my Facebook wall. You know the memories. Uh, it was two years ago at Days of the Dead that I had the opportunity to meet uh, the late Rowdy Roddy Piper. Right, and uh, seeing the picture with Piper, they were doing a They Live reunion that weekend with he and Meg Foster and uh, Keith David. So uh, it's hard to believe that's been two years ago. It's still hard to believe when I look at that picture and seeing him smiling, looking in good health, uh, that Roddy's left us. You know, and I am trying to remember, and I know you mentioned Sid Haig, and I remember him vividly in the NBC television series, uh, Buck Rogers in the 25th Century. 
Wow. Yes, he actually had some uh, eight by tens from that as well. Really? Yeah, sure did. I had some from the A team. I, I can't remember the movies with Pam Greer that come to mind. But he had some of those as well. Finn is a very deceivingly uh, seventy-eight years old. I think very spry, uh, potty mouth kid. Uh, <laughs> still very uh, up, up, up in arms. I mean, still up on uh, what's going on in the world today. And uh, he's a class act, a true pleasure to me. And I got to say that for Elvira too. Cassandra Peterson was so friendly. He does at these conventions. Uh, if you, if people listening have never been to one. You're not the only person there to meet one of your favorites, and of course you can't take 15 to 20 minutes of people's time. But I have to—I'll <laughs> tell you, Eddie, uh, Elvira cracked me up because she's such an old school girl. Because she asked me, I was getting towards the end of the line when it was my turn, and she said, "Do you know where a broad can get a brewski around here?" And I just had to step back and say, "Girls of my generation don't talk like that." <laughs> I loved it so. <laughs> So where'd you take her for the damn beer? <laughs> I know. I wish. Well, I, I said to say, uh, if I give you an extra hundred, <laughs> I would go that high. Uh, let's discuss motorboating. I can't talk about Elvira without the elephant in the room. I mean, uh, they were still out there. Let's put it that way. Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Miracles of modern... Whatever you want to say. I don't know. Hell. <laughs> it's probably the only time we ever discuss Elvira. Everyone talks about her bosom. The rest of her figure, I mean, she's got some tremendous legs that would rival Jane Fonda and Suzanne Summers. I don't know what her fitness program is, but I want on it. Yeah, really. <laughs> but, dude, I would have very quickly said, tell you what, uh, let's go. I'll go buy the first five rounds. <laughs> Be able to sit down and share a beer with Elvira, Cassandra Peterson. That would be. I'm sorry. I, I'm just. I'm going to use the phrase. That would be a mark out moment from heaven. Oh, that's what I was going to say for uh, for her and Ric Flair, especially. Those are true mark out moments. Yeah, I bought uh, Flair beer me. before. <laughs> yeah, and the thing about you know never meet your heroes. I had talked about that with some people in line, and I was like, at least uh, this guy was you know uh, very kind and gracious with his time because. And that's why I put up my post on Facebook. I mean, whatever you think of him, I know a lot of people have negative <clears> connotations <throat> when you bring up Ric Flair nowadays, but I just think of him watching him in my entire life. I cannot remember professional wrestling uh, in my 37 years on this earth without him. So, uh, that was pretty cool. Well, I'll just go ahead and say this, and um, ladies and gentlemen, please forgive me. Let's just say that there is a huge difference between the Gold Club and the Phoenix Lounge in Atlanta. Seville Quarter in Pensacola, Florida, and the Zamora Shrine Temple in Birmingham, Alabama. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> exactly. But um, got to ask this one before we get into it. And I know that you're um, just under two weeks away from a great one in Carrollton, Georgia. Normally, um, for those who know Shane and I on the Saturday Showcase, the Shooters Gallery, you know that every, you know, we don't just cover pro wrestling. We cover a number of different topics. And mm -hmm. that I, thing's off the table. Uh-uh. No, and the Shooters, <laughs> this is one that I'm actually sitting back going, yeah, this one's going to be some really good questions coming around. I got into a, um, a late conversation earlier today on social media. Um, of course, with a person that I followed for quite a while, and we we go back and forth on Twitter, the Orange Cone. Um, <laughs> guy's priceless, nine times out of ten. And apparently, oh shoot, let me go ahead and send this one real quick. Sorry, I was trying to pull up one message that I'd sent myself and forgot to send another one. Have you heard about the new charter system in NASCAR? Uh, as far as uh, they're going to be doing the version of the chase in other divisions of NASCAR, is that what you're referring to? New. No. <clears throat> okay, nope. that I'm unfamiliar with. That. I'm going to go ahead and quote Fox Sports on this one right there, and I'm giving full credit to them for this report. In one of the most significant announcements in NASCAR history, Chairman and CEO Brian France confirmed that a deal has been struck between the sanctioning body and the Sprint Cup team owners to create a charter system. In effect, as the 2016 NASCAR season prepares to kick off this weekend at Daytona, the new charter system addresses three key areas. 
participation, governance, and economics to promote a more predictable, sustainable, and valuable team business models. Each of the 36 teams that have attempted to qualify for every race since 2013 will be given a charter by NASCAR that will guarantee them a spot in each week's Sprint Cup race. Fields will be reduced from 43 to 30, 40 cars, 43 to 40, with four open spots each week to go along with the 36 guaranteed ones. The agreement also establishes a team owner council that will have formal input into decisions and provides charter teams with new revenue opportunities, including a greater interest in digital operations. Teams will be able to resell the charters privately for whatever they can charge. Case point scenario, Rob Kaufman, the former majority owner of Michael Waltrip Racing, for example, can sell his charters to the highest bid. Two likely buyers of those would be Stuart Haas Racing for the 41 and for the, um, Joe Gibbs for the 19 that debuted last year. It appears, um, and the quote is, it represents a landmark change to the business model of team ownership in NASCAR, according to Brian France. There is more to the story, and I will send you the link. But based on what you've heard, what do you think about this? Mm. At first thought, I think it goes, uh, it makes qualifying that much more uh, degraded, in my opinion. I mean, why don't we just now do, uh, not to go <laughs> for a hot, the hot take right here, but uh, why don't we just do like the uh, bus shootout or the whatever it's called now? I'm gonna get the Saturday. The uh, what is that? The, the duels. But the duel. Uh, no, the uh, the expedition race. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, well, they draw the uh, names for qualifying out of a hat, basically, because if they've got 36 teams guaranteed and only four spots, I mean, you you know you're guaranteed. I just I just wouldn't call it qualifying. I'd call it positioning. I would call it what it is because they're not actually qualifying for the race if they're guaranteed. As far as limiting the field, and I know you remember this, it wasn't that long ago in the late 80s, early 90s, when there were still only, I believe, 34 or 36 cars on the track before the expansion to 43. And at some of these uh, short tracks, especially you know, like Martinsville and Bristol, if you're starting 36 on back, you're already a half a lap down right. the start of the race, which just creates chaos so quickly as soon as that checkered, because you're not going to stay there long. And, uh, I mean, reducing the field a little bit, I like it because now, you know, I, do they even do a rookie of the year anymore? Yes. We just don't see. Oh, they do? Okay. Yeah, so they I, still do. been very quiet. Um, but as far as I, I think that'll get away from the old start and parkers, I think, because there was just way too many of those that would start, run one lap, and collect that last place finish. Yeah, but also by the same token, what about some of the bigger teams that we've seen have car trouble and um, tire trouble over the years, over the, like over the last three, where you'll have a situation where you have a first lap wreck or a blowout or an axle or an engine or something like that on one of the big teams because it's happened to Hamlin, it's happened to Logano. Well, not necessarily one of the big teams, but you know what I mean by that. I mean, it's like, well, you know, the, Oz does need a racing team, and therefore you have Brad Keselowski and Joey Logano because they are both somewhere over the rainbow. I now pronounce you. And, I mean, we've seen it happen to Jimmy Johnson, Dale Earnhardt, Casey Kane, Jamie Mack, where they'll get out there first lap, second lap, third lap, something's up, something happened. And lo and behold, I'm, I'm not a fan of this. I'm a fan of cutting down the field. But when you're going to take it from 43 to 40, but you're going to guarantee 36 spots in a charter, that in my book totally, almost totally eliminates single car teams and small um, small teams from having any viable strength in NASCAR to try to proceed and move forward and grow. Yeah, do you, I was wondering what you, uh, what you thought of my point there where it really degrades qualifying down to just positioning right. per se. I mean, I agree 100%. It does. It takes it completely and totally. I mean, okay, fine. You've got four wild card positions. What's the difference between those four wild card positions and adding four more spots to the chase? Nothing. I mean, because most of your 36 teams are going to be multi car teams. I mean, yeah, right. okay, you're going to have Furniture Row. I mean, you know, True Extra Furniture Row, and they've been viable contenders for the year. Wood Brothers, they've been viable contenders. But you've got some new teams that are hoping to try to make that inroad to try to get their visibility up to where they can increase revenue, increase exposure, and, and, and build their team. And this, to me, really guaranteeing 36 spots 
does nothing more than give four people a possible cameo appearance every week. Now, right. Continue, sir. You're sorry. I didn't. I mean, I didn't mean to run that long. Go ahead. Oh, not not at all. I agree with you. You said a cameo appearance. I think you're not going to see the same people at the bottom of qualifying. Some of those guys are going to go home if you are going to have eight to nine cars jockeying for basically four positions with 36 guarantees. If, like you said, we're squeezing out the little man. I don't know how many single car teams still exist beyond Furniture Row Racing. I think the Wood Brothers still are a single car entry. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, over at Chip Ganassi, a uh, two car team with Larson and McMurray. Everybody else is at least three that comes uh, to mind. So Penske. Like, I think Penske's still two cars. That's right. I just right. Yeah, two. Yeah, the, the, the Penske's princesses are still two car team. <laughs> I love those subtle digs each and every time. I'm sorry. Was I, was I, was I, wait, was I actually being subtle? No, I need to change this crap then. <laughs> Let me go ahead and do this for those who don't have a clue. I'm not a fan of Joey Logano, nor am I a fan of Joey's husband, Brad Keselowski. Okay? Let's leave it at that. <laughs> uh, and by the way, speaking of NASCAR, it's crazy that, that uh, the Bud Limited, or the I still call it the Bud Shootout, is actually going to be this weekend with the Daytona 500 in less than two weeks. And I can't help but think of what you spoke of. I mean, the Gatorade duels for Daytona, how you get into the race, used to be so compelling right? Uh, with people actually having to qualify for the great American race, and now we've dwindled that down even more. If I'm these teams, why would I risk anything in the duels? I mean, I might actually just sit it out and see what NASCAR says. You can't do that. Really? Well, I qualified 17th. I'm not going to run 50 laps with a chance to tear up my number one car. Uh, this coming Friday, matter of fact, um, at 5.55 p.m. local time, uh, the Sprint Cup Series Unlimited, Sprint Unlimited practice. Uh, you're going to have two brackets wow. on that from 5 to 5.55, 6.37.25. So the Sprint Unlimited is going to be um, putting everything in place. Then Saturday, you've got on-track activity, all Sprint Cup, pra- um, two different practice sessions, plus you've got at 8.15 Eastern time, on Fox TV, the Sprint Unlimited, 75 laps, 187.5 miles this coming Saturday night. Wow. And they've got pole qualifying on Valentine's Day, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, honey, they're qualified at Daytona. Happy Valentine's Day. I was about to say, somebody's going to have to put off that steak dinner with the chocolates and wine until that final car has crossed. <laughs> we are going to see a spike in divorces. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna ditch Valentine's dinner to go to Daytona. You're taking and also <laughs> Valentine's Day is also the NBA All Star game. Yes, it is. Matter of fact, so, oh, that's, uh, I'm just not glad good that... positioning. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. No, it's not. Nope, nope, nope. Good luck prying red blooded. American males away from the box set this, uh, this Sunday. Yeah, good luck with that. Guess how many people are going to be watching on smartphones and tablets and their watches? <laughs> well, I was going to say, if you want to play it smart, how many people are going to go out on Saturday night and just do Valentine's a day early? I would. <laughs> I would. I'm, I'm intelligent course, enough to go with that alternative. Of course, then again, I'll bring it up. Well, there's the uh, skills competition, the three-point shootout, and the Gatorade Slam Dunk Contest. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my, D- well. my DVR is already set for the slam dunk contest of the three-point competition. I'm not that damn worried uh, about the motor skills competition. I know they all know how to do the crap. Okay, you bring you brought up the dunk contest. I've got to say, Zach Levine, or Zach Levine, how you pronounce his name, tremendous second-year player with the Minnesota Timberwolves. I am excited to see all of seven-foot Andre Drummond, center for the Detroit Pistons, in the freaking dunk contest. I do not have the field of competitors in front of me. I've been very lax about keeping an eye about who's actually going to be competing this year. Uh, I do know Terrence Ross, uh, a nice forward for the Toronto Raptors, as well as, I believe, Will Barton, who has got some tremendous hops for the Denver Nuggets. So it could actually be an intriguing field this year. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I was reading a story, actually, earlier today. Um on yahoo sports because damn it somebody has to 
Um, apparently, they're still saying that um, from a little while back, Vince Carter slam dunk contest show is still the gold standard. And it's like, you know something? There are those moments in time where you legitimately have to sit back and say, yeah, you got it right for a change, kids. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. Vince Carter still toiling away as a bitch player with the Memphis Grizzlies and how much he was called half man, half amazing and Ben Sanity. I mean, took the league by storm. Yeah. And for those who thought MVP came up on that on his own, <laughs> sorry, had uh-huh. to get that one in half man, half amazing. Yeah. Gee, wonder where did we hear that before? Oh yeah. Vince, not that Vince, the other Vince, Vince Carter, you know, the one who plays basketball, but <laughs> I have to ask it. I've been dodging the bullet because I started out with the NASCAR thing. Your thoughts on the pooper bowl this year. Oh, man, uh, if I would had the opportunity, I think you know, based on the way I pick, I would, I did take the Denver Broncos to win this game. And I understand, and it's easy to say in hindsight now, but I wish we had this archived a week earlier, but 15-1 uh, and the Panthers, I, it's not a hater thing. It's just if Carolina had a tremendous defense, and make no mistake about it, their defense played well. Sunday evening. Uh, Peyton Manning certainly did not have his way. No, he did not. The defense. And but Denver's defense, my gosh, what they did to Tom Brady and the New England Patriots in the AFC title game. I mean, and then doing it to the MVP, I, I've really got to say, and I saw some of the pundits talking about this on Pardon the Interruption Monday, I do agree. This one year Denver Bronco defense, and I know this, this is going to upset some people. It's close to being as good as a one-year defense of the 1985 Chicago Bears because you look at what they did to Brady, a four-time Super Bowl champion, actually the defending champion. And then you look at what they do to supposedly the new face of the National Football League, Cam Newton, who just won the MVP the night before, could not be stopped. And I mean, even in the playoffs, they're hanging 40 on uh, 31 on Seattle and 50 on the Arizona Cardinals. And, wow, what they did Sunday night. Von Miller... Uh, he was going to be an unrestricted free agent. I don't think he even sniffs the market in one no. month. <laughs> no, I think they back a Brinks truck up to his door and say, we're sorry. And it was cool to see DeMarcus Ware still playing at a high level. Oh, God, uh, yes. Just as much. But I guess, you know, I've got to talk about the elephant in the room that's been on the buzz the last uh, 48 hours. Oh, please get me started one, on this. Please get me started on one, this. <laughs> one, Cam Newton. I will say this. Eddie, I feel like I'm on an island, literally, because I am the one Auburn Tiger fan that does not give Cam Newton a pass. Uh, I'm sorry. He played at Auburn. He won a national title on the Plains. Good for him. But it's different when you get into the National Football League. And I will just say this. If you're going to dab and dance and say, if you don't like it, stop me. Well, someone did, and they did it multifold. And then you act like a petulant two-year-old that's where it comes down. And it's amazing to me on social media. I've seen everyone talking about the press conference. I say to hell with the press conference. I've seen plenty of professionals, or even coaches, leave a press conference early. I'm talking about his conduct on the field, his pouting, and even today, that fumble near the end of the game. Thank you. He said, he said I would not die for that ball because it put me at risk of injury. And all I can think is, you fool, Ronnie Lott had a finger amputated to play in the freaking Super Bowl. This isn't the preseason. This isn't week eight. This is your season on the line. Injury be damned. If there's a football at your feet, you go and get it. Because you're going to be off for a couple of months and you can recover. Right. That is my major hinge point because I'm going to sit back and say this. Everybody wants to misconstrue what I said on my Facebook page as, as it pertains to Cam and the press conference ordeal. Oh, boy. Let's go. I'm going to I'm going to pull this up and I want everybody to hear the inflection about the way I am genuinely saying this, because obviously people are not quite catching it. So let me go ahead and run. Hang on a second. Oh, thank you, Jacoby. <laughs> want to thank good friend of the family, Jacoby Boykins, for making a post, even though he posted it on my page and not to be on ringside page. I'll cover that event in just a couple of minutes. Um, I've, I've just I want to get this in. So I'm going to go ahead and lay this one out there, point blank. I respect Cam Newton's ability as an athlete. I respect Cam Newton's ability as a quarterback. Look, I love the things he does for kids and for the community and the way he gives back. It is beautifully, it's understandable for him to be down and upset with the result of a game. 
That having been said, Carolina Panther fans who would be watching this press conference and everything during the latter part of the game deserve better from the leader of the team in the face of the franchise, much less from the MVP of the whole damn league this year. I'm not saying that he needs to stand there and be cheery and smile saying, hey, we'll get him next year or anything of that ilk. It's okay to be pissed during a loss. Trust me, been there, done that, understand the concept. And for those who don't know me, I'm a very competitive son of a bitch. But I've got to say this, if you want to take the glory after the victory, you have to be able to suffer the arrows, not to mention stupid questions from the reporters after the loss. Look, as it pertains to the press conference, I've been in press conferences before on both sides of the podium, and I've heard members of the media get it wrong on more than one occasion. But that doesn't always justify an equal yet opposite reaction. When you're losing on the field, you have to be bold enough and brave enough to stand up and say, we're getting our asses kicked, and this game ain't over yet. Either our defense does something or I'm going to find a way to do something. You don't just do that little flop in fetal position and go like you're going into a little baby tantrum. Uh-huh. Here's my other one that I'm going to sit back and say that I haven't made really public on the um, on social media other than on Twitter. I recently found out, uh, while this whole thing's been unfolding, that for the first time ever, while Cam was being interviewed at his podium, you had a member of the Denver Broncos defense at another table who was spouting off rhetoric denigrating Cam, denigrating the the Panthers. And I I will sit back and say this. Knowing this now, I have no problem whatsoever with the fact that Cam got up and walked away. He showed that he was the bigger man, the better man. He did not try to engage in a war of the words. They did not. I I did not see where they identified the particular player. It wasn't where it wasn't Miller because you know they do differently. It may have been some damn scrub. I don't know. But I will sit back and say this, knowing the fact that he was having someone in his ear from the Bronco squad who was not acting in a professional manner, I'd have probably walked away too, because if I hadn't walked away, I'd have walked over and slugged the son of a gun straight in the jaw. And I want to say this too, uh, Akib Khalid, cornerback for Denver, as well as Danny Trevathan, or Trevathan, excuse me, linebacker for Denver. They ripped his conduct during the game, and those are black players, so people can drop that whole race card to me. Mm. Um, Look, um, and, and you know, I've, I'll say this too. This is, I saw uh, Michael Wilbon, Tony Kornheiser, gentlemen that have covered sports thirty-five years plus, and Wilbon right. said, "You know, I've seen people in crushing defeats. Ernest Biner with the fumble would be." Cleveland Browns, Fred Brown, who had to sit there and watch Michael Jordan hit that shot over him for North Carolina. Uh, Michael Jordan himself, he said men that are bigger in their sport than even Cam Newton, and they stood there and handled it like a pro. And, you know, it was just the whole deal about the dabbing. And, you know, and if you're saying you've never seen anyone play like me at this position, you're scared of me, and if you don't like it, stop it. And someone did, and you pout. And that's my thing. I, I, and I, I took a lot of backlash in the last two days from Auburn fans saying I'm being disrespectful. And I'm like, it just, I don't care that he won the title at, uh, at Auburn. I mean, it doesn't give him a free pass for his behavior. It doesn't. Nothing ever does. Look, Kenny Stabler was one of the greatest quarterbacks, was a great quarterback for the University of Alabama. He got in trouble. Alabama divorced themselves from him faster than people could blink. Remember that controversy, Uh kids? So for me, the whole scenario is simple. Everybody, now I'm going to say this point blank, and I want everybody listening live on this ninth day of February 2016 or whenever you're listening to the replay of this. Get over yourself. I'm over me. I don't have a problem with the whole scenario. I understand where this is all going. Make it about the individual. Make it about the heart of the individual. If you want to make it about casings, skin, you're barking up the wrong damn tree. Y'all got a lot of growing up to do out there, folks. When you fall back on the convenient crutch, 
you yourself miss the crux of the point that is to be made in the grand scheme of things. True? True, and let me say this. He's a young man at 26 years old. For as hard as I was on him these last five minutes, I will also say this. There's plenty of time for him to sit back, reflect, grow, mature, and still become the player he can be and still accomplish everything he wants to set out to do. But uh, I do hope that the humble pie he was served Sunday evening and the aftermath afterwards serves him well. See, I've got to say this, and I'm going to draw heat for this, and I frankly don't care anymore. I was one of the ones who, when LeBron James was still young in the National Basketball Association, well, I want to do my little ceremony, and I want to do this, and I want to do this, and I want to do this. What have you done? What have you ever loving done? Nothing yet. The minute that LeBron won a championship, I said, okay, you're a NBA champion. Go do your thing, dude. You've earned the right to do it. I have never, I have never been one who believes, oh, you can just do this because you're fill in the blank on whatever the hell you want to, folks. I believe accolades are earned. I believe privileges are earned. I believe the opportunity is earned. Nobody's entitled to a damn thing. You think you are? Okay, fine. You go eat some really bad Taco Bell food and tell me if you're not entitled to try to dodge the bathroom for 20 minutes afterwards. Guess what? You'll be begging to get in that damn place. There's a loose simile in there. Trust me on this one because I decided I was getting a little bit too serious and I wanted to go for cheap levity. <laughs> Even though it was a really crappy simile, who cares? But <laughs> I want to say one last point, too, because I saw this a lot from people saying... I find myself rooting for Peyton Manning because it's the last one, and Cam Newton will be in four or five more before his career is over. Well, let me say something, kids. There's no guarantees in the National Football League. You know I'm a Miami Dolphins fan. Dan Marino reached Dan the Marino. Super Bowl in his second season, record-setting year. Everyone you know, had him peak for greatness that he would get back to four or five more. He never saw <laughs> it again. Aaron Rodgers, one of the best quarterbacks of this generation, won a Super Bowl. He's over five years and counting since he went back. Guess what? He's in his 30s now. There's a list of guys, and I'm not saying it won't happen. I'm not saying that the Panthers will fall down, but as we know, teams can come from worst to first that quickly, and uh, there's no guarantees they'll ever be in this position again. And I'll sit back and say this because, remember, Marino had the golden opportunity because of the fact that they didn't have to deal with salary caps and free agency and everything else. Uh, to think that Joe Montana – had four Super Bowl championship as a quarterback, uh, bef- and this was before free agency and salary caps and everything else. Um, you know, to a degree, there was free agency, but not to the extent there is now. I mean, at, at back in those days, people honored their contracts. <laughs> Sorry, truth. Oh, sure. And, and I mean, think of this, Eddie, with uh, Colin Kaepernick just three years ago. We were told there's never been anybody like him with his scrambling ability, his size, and his arm. He got to one Super Bowl. Does his career look like he's going to be in another one? You can get him for a ham sandwich now in a trade if you like. Right? Yeah. There's just no guarantee. And you get Johnny Manziel for a fifth of Jack. Oh, jeez. Don't get me started on Johnny football. <laughs> Johnny fool ball is more like it. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, it's the truth of the matter on that one. And I'm, I'm very blunt and very realistic about it. Once again, we live in this era of entitlements where everybody figures they automatically deserve something because blank. And everybody wants to fill in the blank on it. I mean, I'm sorry. I believe accolades are earned. I believe I believe honors are earned. I, damn. Can I pull an Eddie Lane transition for a hot second? Bring it on. Just based on what you said, it transitions into pro wrestling last night as far as accolades earned and putting in the time with the retirement sadly, prematurely, of Daniel Bryan last night. There's a guy that worked as he said in his own going away address last night, I enjoyed working in the back of restaurants and bingo parlors and parking lots of gas stations just as much as I did working in front of 70,000 people at WrestleMania. That guy earned everything he ever got. 
damn straight. Do me a favor. And I just thought, oh, go, sorry. No, I, go I've ahead. I've got to say this. I, uh, it will come back to it, I'm sure. But I, it was amazing to see him get almost a half hour, no under, under interruption and no commercials, just a chance to speak freely to the people. That was a really cool moment. And the fun part on that whole scenario is not only do you get all the time on the USA Network, but they still went about 15 minutes more on the uh, WWE Network. Didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. As soon as Raw started going off the air, they had it at the bottom. This con- uh, The Daniel Bryan celebration continues on the uh, WWE Network. So I thought that was cool as hell. I hope that's archived where you can see that on the network. I have not seen it, and I looked for it late last night, early this morning, and I did not see it, so it may have been a one-shot wonder. I don't know. They may... Uh, remember, they also do run um, replays on Hulu, so they may tag it on Hulu as a Hulu exclusive. True. That's right. Scary thought. Uh, question. Can you run one more? Absolutely. Folks, tell you what. We are going to take a very brief break. We will be back on Back to Basics right after this. where everything is on the table and nothing is off the record. I think we've proven that all over again. And you thought you'd have to wait for us till Saturday for the Shooter's Gallery. <laughs> 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 Welcome back in Back to Basics Live on this Tuesday night, 1055 Central Standard Time. It's cold out there and it feels... Da- it's winter time in Alabama. It's supposed to be cold, damn it. Fast Study Lane live in Studio One for the Promoter's Desk. Welcoming back tag team partner Shane Knowles. Right back over here, Eddie. Nothing is off the table. Let's do it. I noticed that you have a DVD available from the Tag Team Title Tournament available on PeachStateWrestlingAlliance.com. That is correct. From the January 16th event. Yes, sir. I need a copy of this. You shall get a copy of this. And folks, let me go and lay this one out there real quick. For our friends who live in the southeastern U.S. who did not get a chance to catch the tag team title tournament back on Saturday, January 16th at the historic VFW Fairgrounds, you missed a great night of pro wrestling action. And for those that's like, oh man, y'all need to put it on YouTube. No, the hell they don't. (laughs) I'm sorry. I love YouTube. It's got some great purposes. But no. I will sit back and say this. The DVD, $15 each, right? $12 plus $3 shipping and handling? That is correct. Folks, it's well worth it. I'd say that if I wasn't affiliated with the company. I'd say that if it wasn't my voice as one of the voices doing commentary for the show. I'd say that because I watched it and I say it as a wrestling fan. And I mean that sincerely. When you get a chance to check out the website, first and foremost, PeachStateWrestlingAlliance.com. You will find links to DVDs of previous shows. Now, how far back do you go on a lot of the shows? It just depends on demand, right? We do. We can go all the way back to uh, March 22nd, 2014, the night Jeff Hardy came to town. Nice. Yes, I was supposed to be in town for that night, but life happened, which really sucks. But in just over one week from now, Saturday, February the 20th, PWA, back in action, back at the VFW Fairgrounds. I just, I don't, dude, look, I'm, I'm going to say this point, and Shane and I have had this conversation off, I'm off air. We've had it face-to-face in person. Central Elementary School is a cool little place. It really is, and I will mean no disrespect in any capacity whatsoever because I know the folks at Central Elementary are fine folks, and they do, when everything works out, they go out of their way to accommodate Peach State, right? They do, absolutely. Uh, I, and I want to say that about them. It's very uh, different with a the venue. They didn't know us from Adam Pouscat. The day I came, the principal of that school gave me a key, and he said, uh, should anything ever come up, I know where I need to get that key. And the trust they had in us from day one has been amazing. And actually allow us to take flyers and give out to the kids on Fridays. Uh, actually, the kids with good behavior, which I thought was pretty cool. You have to earn that to get a poster to know that wrestling's coming over the weekend see reward earned (laughs) earned not entitlement there's a difference trust me on this one 
Hey, rookie. Never mind. Not going to do it. Not going to. I've just been hitting voice after voice after voice tonight, and I don't know why. But want to go ahead and bring this one up? You are knee deep in it all over again. Shay, how the hell do you get in the middle of all this? Oh, uh, you talking about with uh, my tag team partner, Nigel Sherrod. Mr. As Seen on TV, Nigel Sherrod, and yours, you yourself will be taking on? The beautiful bald bestie, the new tag team champions. This is a non-title match, but uh, it was interesting. The besties, uh, they won the titles January 16th. They were off January 30th, took the evening off. And uh, they came back and said they wanted to face Nigel Sheridan and myself because the team uh, that did not, and you know, I thought this was kind of cool, uh, that did not advance uh, due to the match being thrown out. But unlike the exotic one, intervening themselves in the main event. We did no such thing, and they think we deserve a fair shot. So love them or hate them, I thought that was a pretty cool move uh, by the beautiful Bob Besties. And Nigel was actually at the Days of the Dead convention. I forgot to mention, not only uh, Elvira was there, but also China uh, was there, Joni Laura. And uh, all things considered, still doing pretty well. And uh, Nigel and I got a chance to talk about it. It was kind of surreal to be wrestling the uh, tag team champion uh, in a non-title match. But uh, I have wrestled Michael Stevens before, uh, over two years ago, and uh, don't let their uh, attire fool you. Uh, they are the tag team champions for a reason. He and Zach Edwards are very, very solid. And I would still like to apologize for the technical difficulties we faced during the opening match between Southside Trash and the Triple Bs. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, life happened. Or what's the bumper sticker from Forrest Gump, the movie that everybody always wants to quote that we're not going to quote right now? Hashtag hell damn ass. Uh, Sometimes. I'll just say it's Forrest Gump. <laughs> there you go. But first off, uh, best of luck. Hope I mean, I look for great things to happen in that tag team match. I wish I could be there. Unfortunately, situations are prevailing. Um, I'm looking forward to rejoining PWA in um, the month of March. It's going to be a banner month all the way across the board. If the invitation's still there, I'd love to be able to come back. Absolutely. You're more than welcome, Eddie, and we'll talk more about that. But you'll be coming back uh, knee-deep in the fire as the first-ever PWA Heritage title tournament per uh, Bill Barron's will be taking place. It is a 16-man tournament. The field has not been set yet. Bill Barron's made that announcement January the 30th. The tournament will begin March the 5th. Uh, applicants have been coming from all over. It's going to be very hard to dwindle this down to 16 deserving pro wrestlers, but I can say on March the 5th, uh, four opening round matches will take place on March the 5th. So stay tuned to PeachStateWrestlingAlliance.com as well as our Facebook page uh, as those announcements come in. I have a really wicked idea. No, not that wicked, but I have a really uh -huh. wicked idea. Hmm. Why not have a? Why not have? Why not combine forces between PWA and Beyond Ringside, and we have a online lottery pool to determine the sixteen people. Mm. We could do it live on YouTube, on the Beyond Ringside channel. Well, I, t I tell you what, I could do. Bill Barron's is supposed to uh, uh, release the sixteen names, uh, I believe, shortly after uh, the conclusion of the February twentieth event. Uh, I can get a hold of that list and uh, be glad to do it. Or, ooh, matter of fact, I have a, I have an evil, I equally wicked idea. I really well, hate do using a little March Madness selection for the field. I guess. Yeah, Sunday the twenty first on Beyond Ringside Live. If we're able to do it. Sure. Let's see how things work out. Let's let's put everything in play and let's see how everything works out. That sounds like a damn good idea, and I'm looking forward to it. March fifth for that one, but. You know something? We got a lot of action going to be taking place on Saturday, February the 20th at the VFW Fairgrounds in Carrollton. In addition to the non-title tag team challenge match, you've got another tag team challenge match that's going to be taking that night where the Get Along Gang, featuring the P-Dog himself, Mike Posey, takes on Dear WWE. Quit stealing. <laughs> quit stealing. Quit stealing. And this time, the original version of it is, which has been going on for a few months now, hashtag trending now. Xander's Haven with Amy Haven. 
So you can say your social outcasts are now trending. The original version that you almost tried to procure is really hashtag trending now. Shane, I'll let you take it from there, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. It's, uh, and, and say this about hashtag trending now. They were in the finals of the PWA Tag Team title tournament January 16th, the Get Along Game, which has several members in the faction. On January 30th, it was Marco and C.B. Suave. And they said, how can you have a tag team title tournament without the Get Along Game? They felt slighted, and they scored the upset uh, January 30th. Uh, as Marco and C.B. Uh, won a devastating maneuver on Ace Haven, if you can imagine this. Marco gave a power bomb of Ace Haven onto the knee of C.B. Suave, and that was toast for him. And they did a good job of keeping Xanders from tagging in during the match. So now, uh, a different incarnation, so to speak, as p dog of the Get Along Game teams with Marco against Hashtag Trending Now. And I think uh, anything can happen at Peak State. And we've certainly seen Hashtag Trending Now uh, go under, to use the wrestling term. We'll see if they can uh, mount the comeback this Saturday, I mean, excuse me, next Saturday, because it would be very hard for them to get a title shot in the upcoming future uh, with two losses in a row hanging on their resume. The No Limits Championship will be back in Carrollton as the champion, Kevin Blue, takes on Drew Adler. I would like to first, I can't wait to welcome Kevin Blue back to the fold. Uh, he won the No Limits title uh, in November. He requested time off and got that time off as he and his wife, Laura, congratulations to them. Uh, had a baby, baby blue, as I call it, uh, stealing a line from a George Strait song. But uh, now he is back and rested after uh, two and a half months off. And looks forward to defending the No Limits title against one Drew Adler. And uh, these are two guys that are similar in stature, a little bit taller than you would normally find in most No Limits competitors. Very lengthy, uh, very good range with these two. And Drew Adler has improved vastly over the last year. Also in singles action on the 20th, a match that a lot of people do not want to miss. Simon Sermon taking on the crown jewel, Jimmy Rave. Yeah, Jimmy Rave and Shane Marks, uh, January 30th, had a very good technical match going. They were doing some things that I had not seen in a pro wrestling ring in a while. And unfortunately, Jimmy Rave... Uh, for those that may have wondered, I've had a lot of questions. Uh, we didn't know this until afterwards. He had been sick all week with a 103-degree temperature and still went out in the main event because he's a true competitor. And I don't think he had any business being in that ring, but that's just the kind of guy he is. Um, but Simon Sermon came out. Shane Marks scored the victory with a roll-up. And even said, he and his manager, D. Witt Dawson, that's not the way they wanted to win this thing. But D. Witt said, hey, uh, there's a title tournament coming. You could be looking at the finals. And Shane Marks and Jimmy Rave, and I think it's amazing because the fans knew that a uh, heritage title tournament was coming for the first time in seven and a half years in the company. And there's a guy, Shane Marks, who just scored a victory over the man who has pretty much dominated Peach State over the last calendar year in Jimmy Rave. So anything can happen. Simon Sermon came out and he jumped Jimmy Rave, who threw up in the ring, uh, sadly. <laughs> uh, that, that, that was really fun for the ring crew to get washed out. But, I'm sure uh, it was. took advantage of this and jumped the man. So now it is singles competition between Simon Sermon and Jimmy Rave. And I'm just going to go ahead and say I would imagine both of those men will be in the field uh, for the Heritage title tournament going forward. And in the main event at this point, this, I'm going to sit back and say, I love to use the phrase from Gorilla, combustible elements are in place. All over the place. <laughs> yes, because you have got the combination of AJ Steele, the real deal, the tank, the juggernaut, teaming up with a person I know also very well in the black rainbow of professional wrestling, calm like a bomb Pandora, taking on the mercenary, the hit for hire. She who you never know exactly what she's thinking because she doesn't blink in the form of America Strong, teaming up with, I would dare say, a mentor for her, as well as the person that she will protect with every gun ready to fire, 
another person that you better not blink when you're in the ring with him because this person will do anything at any time because he wants to in order to gain a victory in Tommy Too Much. Shane? Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, January the 30th, Tyson Beam and AJ Steele versus Simon Sermon and Tommy Too Much. America Strong came in to deliver a low blow to the legs of Tyson Dean and Pandora has seen enough, jumped her, and this was no cat fight. This was brutal. I mean, they beat each other. They rolled outside the ring. They were finally separated. The mixed tag challenge was made. And I mean, we've seen America Strong exert her force as, I won't say a manager, I won't say a valet, I'll say ringside assistant. But now she's stepping into the squared circle where Pandora pretty much owns the ladies' division I would say, in the state of Georgia. And it's going to be interesting to see what someone is prepared for her to be in the ring and not having to watch their back. Uh, But I will say this is a mixed tag where it doesn't have to be man-on-man or woman-on-woman. If it gets into a case, AJ Steele versus America, Tommy Too Much versus Pandora, anything goes from your head to your toes, as Bullet Bob said. (laughs) Wow, I haven't heard that phrase for a while. (laughs) (laughs) Nicely done. Um, Thank you. Ticket prices. Ticket prices are ten dollars across the board for adults. Small children ages six and under get in free with an adult's paid admission. Very cool. Any other little surprises you want to throw out there, or is this gonna? Or are you gonna hold those? Um, as far as I know, those are the matches on the docket uh, for the card for February the twentieth. I'm sure that some people are going to want to stake their claim to be in the Heritage Title Tournament March fifth could be in attendance well i know you and i have been in a little bit of communication i know that there have been some things said but i'm just gonna, i'm gonna go ahead and say that right now due to extenuating circumstances and health concerns i am not going to be able to enter into the pwa heritage title tournament i was actually gonna because oh, heartbreaker you, well you know we had talked about me coming out of retirement and you know, trying to shake off a little bit of the ring rust because you know me, my arrogance every once in a while will get the best of myself. And especially when it comes to the all-you-can-eat buffet at the Golden Corral. And from that vantage point... <laughs> they have that chocolate fountain if they got the cotton candy going. Ooh. Dude, no kidding. No kidding. Believe it or not, I actually, in storage because of our catering department, do have a fountain. I will break it out once every six months and get it fired up and get everything flowing through it just to make sure it still works fine but yes we have a 36 inch actually no around a 48 inch fountain that is used for chocolate and um for white chocolate and milk chocolate and dark chocolate i want to issue the challenge right now to a fellow member of the beyond ringside family smart mark Corey rage it's on golden corral fast eddie lane and you're truly shane knows we'll see you at a later date he would lose so badly he would lose so badly. <laughs> if you're letting me go just on the uh, little six ounce steaks alone, he's done. <laughs> hey, look, you see me at the go- You haven't seen me at the corral in full bloom. My dad, unfortunately, on my birthday, did see the comeback of the intim- of the um, the eradicator as far as the stomach goes. Uh, yeah, I got near the popcorn shrimp and nobody else could. I'm not kidding. I'm dead serious. It was not a pretty picture. And, I this is the part where I actually, before I even touched the popcorn shrimp and the salmon and the ribs, um, I destroyed their, um, I, I, I had no choice but to destroy the salad bar. The C- the Caesar salad did not make it. I was going to say Caesar salad all the way. Amen, yeah. dude. Amen. <laughs> you know, one of these days, I'm actually going to go ahead and get ring um, <laughs> Golden Corral on as a corporate sponsor for BR. <laughs> I think that's the most logical thing I can do. <laughs> that was one of my favorite things going back to NASCAR when the race in Atlanta became the Golden Corral 500. I said that is so fitting. <laughs> that would not in i would think in new hampshire but by god in atlanta it's perfect yeah very true 
I was hoping that the brand new, ep- um, uh, real quick, folks, for those of you listening live, it's 13 after 11 Central Time, 13 after 9 Pacific Time. Um, i had been in communication with the Reverend Dan Wilson because of the Super Bowl this weekend. Um, a lot of our programming got put on hiatus, for which Mabo is still not letting me forget it. Um, Reverend Dan had actually been working to try to put together the brand, a brand new episode of the Midnight Black Mass and get it to us to debut after this episode of Back to Basics this evening. But he sent me a message going, we had a small snafu in post-production. Um, it'll definitely be ready to go this coming Sunday night. So the Midnight Black Mass will be returning this coming Sunday night at its regularly scheduled time, 11 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Central Time. Um, tell you what, before we start heading for the Radio Ranch, want to go in throw, I'm going to go ahead and toss the ball completely into your court uh, for last call. Thoughts, comments, questions, it's all you, brother. Oh, the pigskin season is behind us now, Eddie, and that is sad to say on all levels. Uh, high school, college, and pro is finished. Um, sports sometimes tend to get a little bit boring this time of year. I know that uh, March Madness, I will say just for February, I know we've got NASCAR coming, but uh, conference tournaments will start taking place in college basketball. But, uh, and I want to bring that up. We've talked about college basketball. I could make a case, I think, for 16 to 20 teams that you could put in your Final Four bracket this year, and there is no juggernaut like Kentucky on the docket. So I will say this. I'll go ahead and say it on Beyond Ringside. I'm not going to throw Eddie into this. This is just me, Shane knows. If anyone out there has a way when it comes to March and you got the Final Four right, uh, there's going to have to be some kind of uh, some kind of uh, compensation given to that one because kudos to you if you can call it this year. You know, unfortunately, this is the first year in many many moons that I have not paid a lot of attention to the college basketball scene. I know that um, my University of Alabama Crimson Tide men's basketball squad has been doing well. Um, also, my UAB Blazers have been doing well this year. Glad to hear both of those in full swing. Um, have not heard that much, honestly, but that's because I haven't been listening uh, to what's been going on with Bruce Pearl and the Auburn Tigers this year. But I've understood they're, um, they've had a good little roller coaster working, right? They have. They scored the upset on Kentucky as well as on Alabama, and then the wheels kind of fell off with some injuries and the suspension of the lead uh, speeding scorer, Kareem Campy. They only dressed eight players over the weekend against Georgia, and I believe seven players tonight at Tennessee, and I don't know the final of that game. But uh, he's got some work to do left with what Tony Barbary uh, left him. Uh, I know his Pearl has got three of the top 25, I believe, uh, in the class coming in for next year. So there's certainly hope uh, on the horizon for Auburn. But as far as at the top, I mean, we've seen so many teams at number one already. And I mean, you've got teams like Kentucky and Duke falling out of the top 25, or in Kentucky's case, very close to doing so. You're seeing every week, it's seemingly four to five teams in the top ten drop a game. So if there was ever going to be a year where a mid-major that is a junior and senior-laden team could really make that run, we've seen it with George Mason, we've seen it with Butler being in the title game twice, I think this is the year where one could get hot and maybe win the whole thing. You know, and that is something that I have been actually paying attention to because I don't necessarily refer to the Dayton Flyers as a mid-major anymore because of the fact that they've been so strong over the last probably about 10 years. Um, they have been right. a little bit erratic at different points in time, but one of my favorite teams come tournament time is actually the Dayton Flyers. And they're sitting at number 19 right now, pre up from number 24 from last week. And then you've got other teams that were powerhouses in different years and different timelines um, because I remember for years the Texas Longhorns had been a solid team all throughout the early 90s, dropped out during the mid, came back during the late 90s, um, and then they were on their own roller coaster. They're sitting at number 24, where and they finally recracked or cra- got back into the top 25, uh, where they were not ranked last week, sitting at a 16-7 record. And one that just jumps out at me right now, which I am so glad to see these letters in concurrent sequence when it comes to, even though they dropped this week from number 12 to number 16, I'm referring to the SMU Mustangs. Yeah, and, and I'm like you. I love what Larry Brown's doing there. It's just a shame that they are not going to be a part of the postseason tournament this year uh, due to NCAA sanctions. But that, uh, it was kind of cool. They were the last unbeaten team in Division One for a long time this year. Right, and they're sitting at a 20-2 and two record right now. Um, and like I said, they were down from, um, from 12 to 16. Um, of course, you've got some others that you look at the numbers in play 
Of course, you look at Villanova. Of course, I was a huge fan of their program for years, especially. I mean, unless, of course, they were beating up teams down here. <laughs> but Raleigh Mass and Company. Raleigh Mass Amino, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I definitely follow Raleigh. Um, Maryland Terrapins, number two. The Oklahoma Sooners, three. Iowa Hawkeyes, four. Um, Xavier coming in at number five, up from number six. Yeah, Oklahoma fell from one to three. Villanova went from three to one. Um, last week's number two team, North Carolina, fell down to number nine in this week's survey, or in this week's poll. And now, and now Louisville has taken itself out of postseason play, and they just came off the win over number two North Carolina, and they were second in the ACC. They're not going to be available for the tournament. So um, uh, I know they like to use the term March Madness, and sometimes it seems to go pretty much as chalk. But I don't think so this year. You spoke of other teams that used to be common. I mean, Providence may have the best point guard in the entire nation. Right. Uh, teams like Creighton, uh, Davidson, Northern Iowa, who's also knocked off North Carolina this year, Wichita State. There's a lot of those teams floating around, man. And I just, I just don't see anybody that you could pinpoint and say, oh, I know this team's going to be in the title game, let alone the Final Four. Right, because like I said, I'm looking at the top 25 right now, including other teams that receive votes for the top 25, including South Carolina, Indiana, Notre Dame, San Diego State, um, Duke, yeah. Seton Hall, Gonzaga. Yet once again, you know, you're going to sit back and you're going to think Gonzaga, and lo and behold, normally around tournament time, they have a tendency to really hit stride in most seasons. And so many people still sit back and say, really, Gonzaga? Where the hell they come from? It's like uh, they've been kind of like watch mid February through the end through the end of of getting ready for March Madness. Gonzaga will surprise. They normally surprise people. Um, I was going to say Mark Few over the last fifteen years with Gonzaga has built a very good program out there. And And Oregon, I believe the Oregon Ducks are a top ten team this year. um, Yeah, number eleven actually. They went up from sixteen to eleven. And two teams that completely dropped out of the rankings were South Carolina and uh, Indiana, number 22 last week. So, And so here's the crazy thing, too, that as you know, as we get into conference tournament play, whoever wins these conference tournaments is guaranteed a spot. What if you see one of these teams at the lower seed taking an automatic away? I mean, it, it, craziness. And I'm a guy who roots for chaos, so I'm actually loving it. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> if Warren Buffett's going to offer up that, um, I'm going to start doing my homework again. <laughs> Cause I, yeah, a billion dollars to get the, uh, I could have won the lottery with a lot less work, but you know something? It would have been near his fun. <laughs> but that yeah, is. He offers up a billion dollars for the perfect bracket. I'd like to see him offer, I'm serious, five million or two million just for a perfect final four. Because when those seedings come out, I just. We didn't even mention Purdue, Michigan State, Michigan. I mean, there's so many teams that nobody's great. But like I said, starting this conversation, you could take 16 to 20 and say, "Mm, I'll take them in the Final Four. Yeah, it's really sad because of the situation in play when you've got SMU that has fought, kicked, scratched, and clawed uh, to get back to a realm of national prominence. Of course, like I said, they fell four this week, but they're sitting at a 20 and two record and won't be able to. They're one of the few teams that actually have 20 wins. Other than I believe Oregon is one of them. Um, you got Maryland twenty-one and three sitting at number two right now, up from number four from last week. But by the same token, anything is liable to happen at any point in time. Um, if my notes are say, right, let me say. I was going to say this on Maryland. It's amazing because if they were twenty-one and three and ranked third in the ACC, they would be the talk of the town. But moving to the Big Ten, you don't hear anything about the Terrapins anymore. Uh-uh. And that's the other thing that I have a major issue with as far as the realignment. People, um, You've got schools that are jumping conferences. And, you know, understand, I understand money's where, football's where the money is. It has been for the last 10 years, and everybody's trying to position themselves to be in a super conference now. And I'm honestly going to sit back and say, by the time it's all said, done, and over with, there will be six super conferences for football. And it will be a domino effect when it comes to basketball as well. Same thing's going to happen with baseball. It doesn't matter. But your big three as far as sports go. And, you know, I get criticized because I don't take some of the other sports into consideration. Um, I'm a realist in this regard. Look, I enjoy watching a number of different sports at the high school, collegiate, and professional level. But I'm going to sit back and say, for as much as I enjoy watching Premier League soccer on NBC Sports Network, I also know that soccer in the United States of America is still a considered a mainstream niche sport. 
it's still, I mean, you've got, I mean, if nothing else, I will take hockey over soccer. I mean, and no like I, one has a better postseason than the National Hockey League. Oh, no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's the God's honest truth, and I'll join that one seven days a week. And I don't I don't have that many. I mean, I have teams that I enjoy in the NHL, and I know that they're getting ready to go for their uh, championship run in the NHL right now. So I mean, there's been I haven't kept track. I've watched games, but I haven't really just done all my homework. So I apologize for that one. So I'm I'm going to do some homework before Saturday morning. I'm putting myself I'm taking myself to task. Okay, we'll discuss some hockey this weekend. I was going to say the Washington Capitals with Alexander Ovechkin. They currently are the number one seed in the East, but uh, we've seen this story before. They never advance, and I say never over the last six years. I mean, choking dogs has been used, in a, and that's some of the nicer terms <laughs> for the Capitals. So we'll see going forward. But you round up other sports. I've got to say this. At the conclusion of the January 30th, uh, Peak State Wrestling Alliance event. I got home around 1.30 Eastern time, which is customary for me. And guess who sat up and watched the finals of the Australian Open men's final? Novak Djokovic, Roger Federer, this guy. <laughs> Nine thirty in the morning. Normally. And, uh, but I mean, I'm just a big tennis fan, and it's amazing to see what Novak is doing. Because I, I can't ever remember this. Roger Federer may be the best tennis player we've ever seen. But he really couldn't beat Rafael Nadal there for a good four or five year stretch. Right. But now Djokovic is owning both men. And it's like, and when it's all said and done, which of those three are you going to say? Because if Djokovic passed his Federer, he's getting close. Fed has the most grand slams at 17. I believe Djokovic is up to 11 now. Yeah. And playing at the peak of his power. So, I mean, uh, who knows? <laughs> but uh, I also want to say this that anything can happen. I also watched that Friday or early Saturday morning. Serena Williams lost to Angelique Kerber uh, in the women's final, and it was not a fluke. I mean, yes, Serena didn't play well, but that was due to Angelique. I mean, she took the fight to her, and it was amazing to see because I don't know if there's any if there's really been an athlete as dominant in her sport for that long as Serena Williams. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a fight to see. Yeah, and, you know, I normally make a joke about, oh, Nellie in a dress, but um, <laughs> they could be related. They do face they 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 favor facially. I'm sorry, it's true. But <laughs> Serena favors who? Nelly. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, and go. I, I will admit to the fact that I do genuinely appreciate the talents of Serena Williams. I think she is a dynamite and has been for a while a dynamite tennis player and a great ambassador for the sport. But I just. And I'm glad to see that there are women who are finally getting to that. I don't know if it's the fact that Serena's talents are declining or there's more women that are just getting better. you know. And But coming over to Djokovic for a second, I've got to sit back and say this, because remember, I turned 50 a few weeks ago back in January. And for mm-hmm. me, one of my favorite times was when you had Bjorn Borg and John mm-hmm. McEnroe and those two going at it tooth and nail. And I see similes between um, McEnroe Borg and um, Djokovic Federer. It's just the mannerisms that um, Djokovic has just remind me so much of Bjorn back in the day because there were times when you could not get an emotional response or a rise out of Borg. And everybody, I mean, I always said cyborg, especially after the term became Vogue. But, you know, go from there. I remember a lot of the greats during that era. I just, and for me, there was nobody who could top what Bjorn did for the industry and for the sport of, of professional tennis for all those years and to see what Djokovic is doing, um, just absolutely tremendous. And, yeah, I believe Federer is probably one of the greatest of all time, if not the. Um, of course, you've got so many people that are on the horizon, but they keep, here's the funny thing about it. They keep knocking themselves off at the weirdest times. Yeah, you really saw Andy Murray once he overcame Djokovic, uh, I believe, two or three years ago in that Wimbledon final and then won a U.S. Open okay, he's really going to crack the big three here, and there's going to be a legit big four, and he hasn't sniffed it since. I mean, Joker uh-huh. has been him like 11 straight times. <laughs> yeah, and that's the sad part, because I was one of the ones who were sitting back going that this could actually be, that could have been Murray's breakthrough. Um, so, hey, what the hell? It does break down to it. Um, this weekend, planning to go see, uh, almost said kill shot. Shoot me, please. Deadpool, you going to try to make it? 
I am going to try to make it. It may not be this weekend. Uh, I have had a chance to see The Revenant, uh, which I will say this. Good film. Leonardo DiCaprio, great. And I hate to be one of those that says, if you didn't want it this year, it's bullshit. Well, I will say that, because I have seen some of the other movies that are up for consideration. And Leonardo DiCaprio, it's getting to the point where it's Susan Lucci with the Academy Award. Can he really lose every year? Uh, but also, saw a movie called Spotlight. Uh, with Michael Keaton, Rachel McAdams, Stanley right. Tucci, and Mark Ruffalo, which was a very good film about journalism uh, covering the uh, scandal of the uh, molestation of young boys by Catholic priests and right. how that really rocked. Yeah, it was a really, really good film. Not for everybody, I'm sure, but uh, I think it'll be a contender at Oscar time. I've got to sit back and say this, and because of the release timing, and I'm, I don't know if they're going to try to go back and amend and look at something for next year for... Um, concussion but if considering the timing of when the release was of concussion i genuinely feel will smith was overlooked in that one um so i mean i'm not going to jump up and down and do the i'm going to boycott because of this but i'm going to sit back and say i do believe that they did a tremendous disservice because i saw the movie um will smith turned in a phenomenal job as always he has never in my book had a bad movie unless of course you want to count hancock um I'm sorry, it just wasn't. Hancock was not a good movie. I, Robot? Oh, God, that was good. <laughs> I Am a Legend. Uh, yeah. Legend of Bagger Vance. Uh, I'll, and I will say this, though. It's kind of funny with Will Smith joining his wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, and boycotting the Oscars. Twice, Will Smith has been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actor. 2001 for Ali. He lost to a fellow African-American, Denzel Washington, for yep. Training Day. 2005, nominated for The Pursuit of Happiness, also lost, lost to a fellow African-American actor, um, and his name escapes me right now, Geez, uh, for uh, The Last King of Scotland. Okay. Um, uh, that, that was the film, The Last King of Scotland. I know the one you're talking about, uh, I know the gentleman's name, and I cannot remember it to save my ass right now. I'm so sorry. I don't know why I'm wanting to say... Not F. Scott Fitzgerald. What the hell, Shane? Um, <laughs> the Forrest Whitaker. There we go. Forrest Whitaker. There you go. I thought that was funny. Yeah, twice he's been nominated and lost to another African American. I don't know. It just seemed. I, don't know. But, I mean, for the movie Concussion, I agree with you. He was very good in that. I did see that, and uh, yeah, it's a shame he wasn't nominated. Uh, but as far as Best Picture, uh, I'm. I am going to go with The Revenant, even though I said good film, Leonardo DiCaprio was great. I still think that or Spotlight, uh, I'd have to see some of the others in the field, and hopefully get a chance to, because around here, they, those movies will come to a local theater. They'll play for one week because people don't go see them. <laughs> but uh, I'm the guy that's in the theater seeing Birdman last year by himself. Saying, this is great. <laughs> I'm going to sit back and say this. At 12.31 a.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday, February the 10th, 2016, the first time that I saw a clip or preview for The Revenant featuring DiCaprio, the first words out of my mouth, and I have two people with the tribe here at Studio One that will verify this and vouch for this. My exact words at the end of that tr- that commercial, well, there's another Academy Award nomination for DiCaprio. Yep. That was the first Thing out of my mouth I kid you not before the movie was released when I first saw the first preview the first clip the first commercial the first words out of my mouth well guess who's going to get an Oscar and lo and behold he got the Oscar nomination so I'm going to see if my if my nice little device came true on this one because I'm I'm banking it DiCaprio will win the Oscar for The Revenant this year I hope so. I mean, people, we were talking about this at work the other day, and they were like, well, well, what movie do you think Leo was most robbed for? And I said, that's a good question. That'd be a good topic uh, for a radio show uh, that I'm a part of. And I think, in my personal opinion, 2004 for The Aviator. I mean, his okay. performance yeah. Howard Hughes, that, yes. that shocked me that he did not win that particular year. <laughs> You took that one right out from under me. Stay out of my damn playbook. Ah. Um, yes, but I will agree wholeheartedly. I, be- I believe that should um, that should have been an Oscar nod for him. But by the same token, I'm also going to sit back and say, um, 
there's one person in Hollywood that they blacklisted as far as <laughs> winning his third Oscar and for best male or for best actor. I'm still going to sit back and say there is going to come that role that Tom Hanks has that that they're just going to sit back and say, all right, son of a bitch, we'll give it to him. He was that good. Because there have been a couple of roles that Hanks has had over the years that he should have picked up that additional Oscar. And because remember, um, there was a controversy after he won two straight that they oh, did. You, you right in my wheelhouse for useless trivia. I did this question last week as we're getting close to the Academy Awards. He's one of two men, the other being Spencer Tracy. Yes, that's true. That won uh, consecutive uh, Best Actor. And I asked what two films, it's Philadelphia and Forrest Gump. But I'm like you, since 1994, I can think of two or three, and Captain Phillips comes to mind uh, right at the top of my head. I got one word for you Castaway. Absolutely. Nominated didn't win. How, how do you not win today? That was a tremendous film. Yeah. That that would have put him in that totally rarefied air on a solo basis. They did not want um, they were going they were dog determined to keep him from winning three consecutive best actor Oscars because they did not want anybody to, to eclipse Spencer Tracy. And I don't care if that sounds like a conspiracy theory. Kids, that's not a conspiracy theory, that's conspiracy truth. And I did laugh my ass off though when I saw a post on social media. It says Leo Leonardo DiCaprio may win best actor this year because Daniel Day Lewis didn't make a film. I know it. I know it. That is so that is so damn true. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just thinking I'm I'm gonna stop there. There I almost said something really crass, tasteless, and tacky. And is Michael Moore still alive? Is Michael Moore still what? I'm sorry. Is Michael Moore still alive? He is. Damn. Okay. Much to the sugar in, yes, <laughs> no, I just don't. look. I know I'm going to get hate mail for that, and I'm not a conservative or a liberal. I'm not a I'm de, I'm not a Democrat or Republican. I'm not left or right. I just hate Michael Moore. I think he sucks. <laughs> it's like, dude, please just disappear. Go, bye, see ya. I don't I don't care. You aren't that good of a filmmaker. Go play putt putt or something. Can we kind of bring up one more thing since before this is last call? This is something that really grinds my gears, and I will it, defer to you on this. The upcoming it, Grammy Awards. What the hell is the difference between record of the year and single of the year when the same songs are put in the category? <laughs> the, the Not year. album, record of the year, single of the year, same stuff. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> I have no damn idea. <laughs> Someone's going to have to explain that to me. Look. And by the same token, I'm also going to sit back and say records, record of the year, single of the year, and song of the year. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and speaking of song, one more thing. We're going to put a pretty bow on all of this. I was actually a big fan of Lady Gaga singing the national anthem at her performance this weekend. I know Whitney Houston is the standard bearer, and rightfully so. But I think this kind of showed, because a lot of people haven't been keeping up with Gaga as far as what she's done with Tony Bennett and not just being part of, we'll just say it, the freaks and monsters, and that she actually has a voice, she doesn't lip sync, and she brought it Sunday. I really enjoyed that. I'm going to say this from the bottom of my heart. Lady Gaga, in my humble opinion, has phenomenal pipes. She has great vocal ability. When she gets past all the imaging and the posturing and all the flamboyance, she is a good performer. But it's because of all the imaging and the posturing, all the different tries to, ways to be outrageous. Everybody still to this day wants to out Madonna Madonna. There's only one. So to Miley Cyrus, to and just like this before that, I even said there's only one Grace Jones. So I'll go from there. People are so caught up in trying to get the reaction before they get the response. And I'll be honest with you, if it wasn't for the fact that her hair looked like something out of a 60s alien movie, she had a classy look, almost. I saw a great meme, by the way, that said, when you've got to sing the National Anthem at 6.30 to host the Hunger Games at 8 o'clock. There you go. 
There you go. That's a good one. I like that. I need that. <laughs> I'll send it your way. I closed my eyes halfway through the anthem, and I heard her voice. And it was melodically on it. It was, and I went back and I replayed it, and I closed my eyes from start to finish. During the bridge, Rockets Red Glare, um, too much vibrato for my taste. It sounded like she was back in the 1970s wearing one of those little, um, those little um, hip slimmer belts that spins and vibrates. <laughs> That's what I felt she was doing. I mean, other than that, I mean, melodically she was there, but the vibrato in the bridge just killed me. It's like, that's overkill. But the way she took it out, the way she wrapped it up and took it home. Oh yeah, it's there. It was good. But do I put her on par with Whitney Houston? I say that she could have been easily on par with Whitney Houston because they, they both have great voices. A person that I would actually love to hear sing it on her own terms as a true performer and vocalist, Christina Aguilera. Absolutely. Um, I think Christina's got monster pipes as long as she takes care of herself. Um, I think she's another one that could give the Whitney standard a good run for its money. But as far as it goes with Gaga, look... My guilty vice, there are a couple of songs that she has, that Gaga has, that I actually enjoy listening to. Um, I have a remix of the song You and I, which is actually a bouncy um, dance version of it, which is really cool. Um, Love that song. Yeah. Applause, good song. Do what you want, good song. Um, some of her earlier stuff, of course, I, I'm going to go in and lay out there, go out, ba- I'm going to, some bitch, lay out bad romance. You know, for the intent of the song, it's still a catchy tune. And yeah, I mean, I listen to people like Gaga. I listen to Kesha. Um, I begrudgingly listen to other artists. Sometimes I listen to because I like to listen to different stuff. And others I listen to because I have to and it's my job. Um, To which I'm also going to stick with the Super Bowl for a hot second. And I'm going to go ahead and I'll defer to you on this one. um, On this point. I have said this point blank clear as a bell. Hour one. And I said it on social media. The Super Bowl halftime show was probably one of the 10 biggest disappointments in my life. And I know that's not saying much, but it's the truth of the way I feel. The 50th Super Bowl, the 50th Super Bowl should have been an extravaganza of truly epic proportions. It should not have. I mean, this one felt run of the mill. The only exception. Okay, look, I like Coldplay. But they did not come across as a Super Bowl anniversary band. I'm not saying get Prince back in there. I'm not saying get the Stones back in there. I'm not saying get Kiss in there. I'm not saying reform Pink Floyd or Genesis. I'm not saying the Backstreet Boys, the New Kids on the Block, or in sync back together. Hi, Sammy. What's up? I'm saying that Coldplay did not come across performance-wise as a band that should have been at the 50th anniversary of the Super Bowl. For all of the shenanigans that have been put out in the public forum about what her freaking majesty was doing, especially the, the hidden intent behind the new song, that had nothing, that had no bearing. That is why in my book, Ms. Knowles, Jay-Z's husband or whatever, is irrelevant and has been for a few years. She pitched at Halo. She peaked at Halo. Halo was her 105 mile an hour fastball. Everything after that has sucked in my book. The person who was the star of the Super Bowl halftime show, the incomparable Bruno Mars, Mars has a flair to performance that makes you want to have fun and makes you question yourself if you're not enjoying yourself. Bruno Mars stole the show. Bruno Mars didn't just steal the show. He was the show. 
Like I said, for all you little Beyonce fans running around out there, I don't care. Halo was her Mount Everest. Halo was her trip to the moon. Beautiful song. Just about everything after that has been run-of-the-mill, wannabe horse crap. And like I said, Coldplay, good band. They just didn't seem like they fit the occasion. Shane, your thoughts? I'm right there with you. I like Coldplay, and I've liked them since they debuted with Yellow. But at the announcement that they were going to be the halftime show entertainment or Super Bowl 50, I cringed. Uh, I just, they don't give off that big stadium or a feel. If everyone says they're the new U2, maybe, as far as how they sound. But U2 can bring it yeah. in that situation. And it really seemed like, I don't know, whoever coordinates this deal, they didn't feel comfortable with it being just Coldplay. They knew they had to have a Beyonce and a Bruno Mars, and they kept denying it. All the way up to kick off, it was the worst kept secret that Daniel Bryan was going to win the title at WrestleMania 30. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, pretty much. Unlike you, um, Bruno Mars is incomparable. You stole out of my playbook. He has a flair that is missing from a lot of artists nowadays. And I'm like you. I mean, I it's needed to be bigger. Super Bowl 50 with what we've seen from Michael Jackson and Shania Twain and The Who and The Rolling Stones and Aerosmith. I would have almost liked to see it have been like a CMT Crossroads type deal or a, um, a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, concert that it, where you just, you litter that entire stage. And you know what? I mean, they were so good at the beginning of the Super Bowl bringing out all 50, or right, well, trying to, there's one that's deceased, all 49 living Super Bowl MVPs. I would have liked to have seen almost every living person that has done a halftime show be a part of that inclusion. That would have been that spectacle, that huge moment. If you had a stage shared by the Stones, a Britney Spears, or Bruno Mars, or Prince, you got them all. I mean, that would have had people buzzing like gangbusters. And why not bring back Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson for a night? (laughs) Give them a chance to make up for what they did in 2004. And you want to know the biggest joke that would have actually been played on the whole scenario? If Janet Jackson would have turned around and torn Justin's shirt this time. That would have been beautiful. That would have been effing phenomenal. If you take the chance and take the risk and say, look, here's what we want to do. We got in trouble last time, and we understand the gravity of the circumstances. We paid our multi-thousand dollar, hundred of thousand dollar fines. We took, we've done our time. We've understood everything that's happened, but we want to flip the script. And Janet says, I want to rip Justin's shirt this time. And I imagine that nobody would have been in a chair because they would have been all rolling on the floor, laughing their asses off. I mean, you expect, and there's the word that I hate using because yeah, there is a difference between expectations and reverence for the moment this is it's like look i'll put it this way i turned myself 50 back on january 27th yes i'll i'll milk that horse for a while it took me a while to get here by god i'm gonna enjoy the time and and rightfully so you should half a century on god's green earth when i go into a venue when i went to buffalo wild wings that night of that um, Friday night after my 50th birthday and people were coming up to me going, Eddie, happy birthday. Congratulations on 50. When people were on social media, when I'm getting text messages and phone calls and emails, I mean, when I get to global championship wrestling set that Saturday night and I've got people coming up to the stage going, happy birthday, congratulations. You know, how you made it to 50, how one person said, how you made it to 50, I'll never know because I've known you for that many years and your body should have fallen apart 10 years ago. It's like, thank you. I know this. <laughs> Is anything said on the PA system? No. Hint, hint. Ha ha. Turkeys. But by the same token, no, that wasn't the only reason why I made that reference. Although it's fun to say. <laughs> you get to milestones like the 5 0. And you try to shoot for the stars. It's not just an occasion where it's like, okay, can I have a chocolate chip cupcake and a Zippo lighter? And just go ahead and go, happy birthday. 
No, this is 50 kids. I said the same thing at 30 for a lot of people or 40 for a lot of people. When friends of mine, I mean, it's my God. In one month from now, a member of the tribe here, Mike G, is going to turn 50. I'm barbecuing him, dude. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> but I just, when it came to the Super Bowl turning 50, yes, it should have been a star-studded extravaganza. But instead, we get a pint of milk. With the exception of Bruno Mars, who was the Nestle Quick. <laughs> you, can, you can say traditional quick or strawberry quick. I don't give a flying rat's ass. But he, he was the saving grace to the freaking Super Bowl halftime party. I'm sorry. I just got to do that. Anything else you want to pop out there, Shane? Go for it, dude. Um, no, that was a hell of a last call, I'll say. <laughs> I mean, it started with uh, tennis, and we wound up in our discussion of the Super Bowl 50 halftime show, and I love that about the camaraderie that you and I have, and I hope those listening live to the archive enjoy it as such, because uh, I just want to, I'll just say this, other than uh, sometimes a, pre uh, a prepared topic on the Shooters Gallery, Eddie Lane and I do not have uh, a docket, we do not have a set of topics we are going to talk about, it is a free flow, and I enjoy it, time, sir. <laughs> The feeling is definitely mutual. It's always appreciated. I mean, and this is one of the reasons why we have such a good time on Saturday mornings. Because originally, and go figure, um, Shane and I were going to go an hour. <laughs> we do this every damn time. <laughs> and believe me, if we sat down and thought for about 30 seconds, there's about 25 more topics that we could hit right now. But I think we're going to start making notes and get ready for Saturday morning. Right, brother? Absolutely, we got to save something for the weekend, yeah. <laughs> Folks, let me go and run this down for everybody real quick. Live programming is slated to return tomorrow. That is going to, excuse me, now today, um, February the 10th at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central with, with the To Be Determined show making their return this week. Also on Thursday the 11th. Oh, that's right, my other, I'm reading a clock that's in Central. I'm sorry. That's why it's just, what the hell? Oh, no, it's... Eastern, Eddie. Go Eastern. Okay, go to your one on the right. There you go. Now you're on the right one. Thursday, February the 11th. Oh, a day that will live in infamy for me. At 11 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Central. It is Corner to Corner. Stan Grubb and Company bringing you the best on Thursday nights. This coming Saturday, the 13th, the Shooter's Gallery returns. Yours truly, Shane Knowles, along with the cause, Robert Cosper. Kids, he sent me a message two words he's back the triad returns this saturday and of course on sunday valentine's day oh god are we really going to do this yes we are 6 30 p.m eastern 5 30 central for beyond ringside live and the brand new episode of the midnight black mass will be airing in its regular time slot 11 p.m eastern 10 p.m central Keep your eyes open on BeyondRingside.com for all upcoming show information. And, of course, be sure to check us out on the web in more ways than one. The player is on the website. The, um, the app is available for Amazon, Android, and BlackBerry. Apple users, please check us out on TuneIn Radio, the TuneIn Radio mobile app available for your format. And, of course, you can find us everywhere iTunes, Podomatic, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, you name it. We're out there. Downcast for Apple users. Um, there's a lot of archive.org, YouTube, and Daily Motion as well. Shane, go and throw the shameless plugs one more time, sir. Oh, check us out. Uh, the upcoming Peach Steak Wrestling Alliance event, Saturday, February 20th, at the BFW Fairgrounds in Carrollton, Georgia. Check us out at The Real PWA on Twitter www.peachstatewrestlingalliance.com You can email us at twafanbase at yahoo.com and I will say, Eddie, as we get ready to head to the ranch, I'm noticing a tremendous game here uh, in the association with the Houston Rockets playing at the Golden State Warriors who are unbeaten at home, trying to go for that all-time single-season win record. Uh, it was a 93-all, excuse me, 93-91 Rocket lead. The Warriors have went on an 11 nothing run in the last two minutes and one second, so Looks like a good finish here, late night. What channel is that on? Uh, TNT. So that's going to be down in my 700s. I'm going to say 245 <laughs> for me on direct TV. Uh, you suck. <laughs> <laughs>
I never watch TNT and TBS anymore. I never know what's going to be where. All right. I'll work on that when we get off air. Folks, thank you again to Mark Mabo Bowman for coming on during the first hour. Phil Stamper during the second hour. For our friends in the northeastern U.S. and the the upper Atlantic states, definitely check it out. Combat Zone Wrestling this Saturday in Voorhees, uh, Voorhees, New Jersey at Flyer Skate Zone. And, of course, this coming Saturday as well for Maryland Championship Wrestling. Stan, I understand you said you're going to try to go to that, so I'll be looking for a full report this weekend. Folks, for tag team partner Shane Knowles. I wish that was a wonderful evening. We'll talk to you Saturday. I'm the Magic City Motor Mouth Fast Study Lane saying thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us here on Beyond Ringside Back to Basics. Join us next time as we all go Beyond Ringside. Bye for now.